Inquisition. Let's begin the Inquisition. Look out, Sam. We have a mission to convert the Jews. Jew, 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 Jew. We're gonna teach them from the right. We're gonna help them see the light and make an offer that they can't refuse. That the Jews just can't refuse. Confess. Don't be boring. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Don't be dull. A fact. You're ignoring. It's better to lose your skull cap than your skull. Oh, you're gonna vault. The Inquisition. What a show. The Inquisition. Here we go. We know you're wishing that we'd go away. But the Inquisition's here and it's here to stay. Oh, boy. The Inquisition. Watch out. The Inquisition. Oi, oi. Yes. There, it's here to stay, even if you wish it would just go away. That was from Mel Brooks's History of the World, Part 1. Think of that merry melody as we tackle the shadow side of spirituality this Sunday, February 11th on Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis. The Inquisition, what a joy. Crucifixion lasts hours! It's a slow, horrible death! Well, at least it gets you out in the open air. But I never promise you a rose garden, my beloved true seekers. I hope you're ready to come with your host, Abraxas, on a weaving quest in which we'll construct a darksome tapestry that will reveal how much the Demiurge, the Cosmic Eagle, Jehovah, Allah, and all the big penis gods detest yet crave your ovums of light. I am the supreme being. I'm not entirely dim and how far they will take their party, and how extensive they will manifest themselves to keep you asleep at the wheel of spiritual evolution. The reality is that orthodoxy, the pawns of Yaldabaoth, has never stopped hunting the knowers, the shamans, the Gnostics of the world. And with each victory, their conviler ways to imprison us in psychic filth. Socrates drank the cup of hemlock once upon a tragedy, not too far off, the Church Fathers created the foundation of what would be known as the Twin Demons of the Inquisition and the Totalitarian Regime. That's certainly a wild statement, but our guest today will certainly give us that rusty bloody needle to thread that darksome tapestry we will weave together. And our guest today is Arthur Vers Luis, author of The New Inquisition, Restoring Paradise, Western Esotericism, Literature and Consciousness, and the book Awakening the Contemplative Spirit. He is also the editor of Esoterica and Professor of American Studies at Michigan State University. It's actually very simple, my beloved True Seekers. In ancient times, people were separated by their tribes, nations, religions, and sometimes ideologies. But uh, the lines were set and the spoken word held honorific weight. Everyone knew where they stood even in the higher case of noble intrigue or religious rebellion. It was a time of Conan simplicity, wild prophets and conquering civilizations. One gave allegiance to their gods and kings and went about their business, with a few exceptions, of course. Behavior was punished or rewarded, more or less. I move... For no man. But then there was a problem. A new religion, a Jewish heresy with their own dying rising godmen, sprouted with varied creeds. None of them agreed on the nature of their founder, or even if their founder existed. I'm not the Messiah! Two of those were the Gnostics and the Roman Christians. The Gnostics infuriated the Romans by participating in their services their dismissal of their righteous commands, and their tacit patronizing agreeing with the wave of a hand. After all, the Gnostics were philosophers and mystics who had better things to do than engaged in uh, theological debates with spiritual plebs and mongrels. It rubs the lotion on its skin. It does this whenever it's told. <laughs> so the Roman Church knew that the Gnostics, probably the earliest of all these Christian sects, had to be eliminated. 
Thus, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and the other slaves of Yahuova devised a system in which behavior or identity didn't matter anymore but how one thought. It was politically correctness on Red Bull. There was orthodox thought and heretical thought. See, it's, it's no good, Monta. We've all got to be alike. The only way to be happy is for everyone to be made equal. It didn't matter they all believed in Christ, or that they were from the same city or empire, or that they met on Sunday at church with joy for the Savior, or that they obeyed the laws or anything else. The Gnostics thought wrong. It was their thinking that made them dangerous, not their physical or monetary strength. They thought differently and thus they were dangerous, even if they were one of their own, a Christian and Roman citizen. For the first time in history, merely thinking a certain way was considered treason against an entire system. The church fathers were the first thought police, and as Rome became Christian, other subtle yet effective methods were formulated to eradicate the Gnostics and their pagan brothers and sisters. It was history's true and first totalitarian regime. It was the Inquisition before the Inquisition. And from these draconian axioms, centuries later, the real Inquisition was given birth and, as we'll prove in the show, never stopped, for it became the spinal fluid for all the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. We all come into this world with our little egos equipped with individual horns. If we don't blow them, who else will? And this safari for Gnostics has still got some fuel in the late 20th and 21st century. I kid you not. Arthur painstakingly breaks it down in his commendable and erudite book, The New Inquisition, but we'll give it our best college try at coffee, cigarettes, and noses. In any event, I believe many of you already knew about this tapestry of oppression, consciously or subconsciously. The Archons have always craved our sparks, and they will do whatever they can, with whatever agents they need, to make sure we squander in the dark cells of oppression, in some strange gilded prisons, or in subtle Orwellian dreamscapes. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. To get my point across, let me take from Arthur's book what he calls the archetypal dimensions of the Inquisition. They'll ring a lot of bells for you, from the modus operandi of the orthodox churches to the frozen fury of Stalin or Hitler. I'm going to kill you! The first archetypal dimension of the Inquisition is to have two hands that administer justice instead of one. In medieval times, a church, one hand, judged, and the secular forces, the other hand, meted out punishment. And of course, neither looked totally bad and neither <laughs> took total blame to this day. In the Soviet Union, one hand might be the comforter but also the spying agency, while the other hand swept people into the hells of Siberia. But these two hands are always part of the same demoniac brain. A one-two punch that might seem like a one-two caress at times, but makes the population wonder who exactly is the evil side of the government. Confusion and imbalance are the name of the game in this first archetype. Let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. The second archetypal dimension of the Inquisition is criminalized thought instead of action. One was a heretic by one's thoughts, or even the suspicion of having thoughts that went against the philosophy of a nation. Again, the old Soviet Union is a perfect example. But you can go back to Christian Rome and how gentle they were when meeting people of other cultures. Don't think the wrong thing or else they will come after you. You're all individuals! Yes, we're all individuals! The third archetypal dimension of the Inquisition is the required use of torture against those who've had those wrong thoughts. It was important that the heretic, the criminal, express these thoughts and recant it, even if it cost him his or her life. I tell my kids, only God can make a life. In many instances, it was important that he or she actually have his mind changed before dying, as we see in the novel 1984. If you have the wrong thoughts, the Inquisitor will come for you. Then he will torture a confession out of you and you will recant. 
and then you'll live or die, but it doesn't matter because your wrong thinking is not the issue anymore. You've been cleansed. The fourth archetypal dimension of the Inquisition is to place a permanent blanket of fear over its own people. Sometimes Christian apologists will claim that the Inquisition or the Burning Times didn't kill that many people. As tragic as any deaths are, it's not really a numbers game. That's a red herring of sorts. Mr. President, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair must, but I do say no more than 10 to 20 million killed, tops, uh, depending on the break. The real damage is a fear that is instilled into the citizens to the point all individuality is erased. Wrong thinking can't happen because it's been injected with terror-infected loyalty. Keep your people afraid, even if you don't strike at them that often, and then independent thought can slowly fade away. Make them think they're always watching you. Make them afraid of losing their families. Make them understand that right thinking is the best armor one can wear in a disorganized world. Fear will turn the hunting wolf into the protecting hound right in front of your eyes. I think you have been afraid all your life. And as we can see, the Inquisition and the totalitarian regimes are but twins, in a sense, who, although at odds often, utilize the four archetypes of Inquisition. And that's just a small part of Arthur's book. So you should ask yourself right now, are you afraid to think a certain way? Is there fear when you park your car in what might be the wrong place, or smoke in the wrong corner of the building, or forget to pay your taxes, or is there fear when you see a police car in your rearview mirror? People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. Do you believe that thinking alike with your friends grants you safety? Do you believe in sanity in numbers and hope this also makes your family and career safe? When was the last time you just walked outside without laws and societal pressures not weighing down on your shoulders? All I've ever known to be true is a lie. In other words, no matter where you live, the Inquisition is alive and well, and to the Gnostic it is both cosmic and personal. Like William Blake wrote, prisons are built with stones of law brothels with the bricks of religion. And as Lao Tse said, the more laws we make, the more outlaws we create. And the laws against thought are the most devious ones ever invented and still plague our modern society, in our small or large circles, in our day-to-day -day business, to the guilt one might feel at expressing and imagining something real and deeper. Ah, Jehovah. You are the greatest, and there is no god like you. Why use thunderbolts and plagues to train us baby seals when you can simply surround the human imagination with the hungry maggots of fear? We will not live by your commandments. We're free. Hey, there is no freedom without the law. But enough of my drivel. Let us continue weaving this tapestry with our interview with Arthur. Arthur... What exactly led you to write such a sweeping and in-depth book about the roots of uh, modern totalitarian regimes and its, and its roots in historical inquisition? Well, I've done a lot of work on uh, a number of books on uh, different esoteric groups, particularly Christian esoteric uh, groups, mostly focusing on the early modern period, including Jakob Burma and uh, a, lot of, a lot of mystics. And I realized as I was working on them that there was almost nothing written on the other side of that. Uh, the people who often uh, persecuted uh, mystics, going back all the way to the origins of uh, uh, what we think of now as Christianity. I hadn't intended actually to write uh, the New Inquisitions as a book. It just unfolded pretty naturally. I started writing an article about uh, Eric Vergelin, who is an anti-Gnostic uh, modern writer. I did an article on him, which was published in the journal Telos. As that article developed, and I began to realize the kind of inqu the inquisitional pathology, as I call it, is deeply rooted in even secular modernity, another article started to emerge. And so I, I worked on that, on Carl Schmidt, a German uh, legal theorist, and also uh, for a significant period a Nazi. 
uh, jurist as well. I slowly began to realize how deep this uh, inquisitional pathology is rooted in the West, and that's how the book emerged. So I didn't really set out to write it as a book, but each article emerged naturally from the last. Uh, the book as a whole is the counterpart in a lot of respects to earlier work that I did on mysticism and esotericism. So basically moving back in time, uh, the seeds of Inquisition didn't really begin in medieval Europe, but actually, as you point out, in the minds of the heresiologists and their polemics against the Gnostics. That's right. As the book began to emerge, various parts of it, I realized that I had to go back to late antiquity and to the, what I call heresiophobic rhetoric that you find really deeply embedded in uh, some parts of early Christianity. And that anti-Gnostic, anti-heretical language and set of perspectives uh, really set the, the stage for uh, what in the medieval period became the Inquisitions and then slowly became secularized and emerged again, in a different form in contemporary forms of totalitarianism. <clears throat> what exactly are its uh, goals? It's uh, mind control, or what do you call it, the thought control, fear, horror? What are some of the characteristics that uh, began with Tertullian and his gang, and then were later taken up by uh, other secular and religious entities? Well, I think with... Tertullian, with Irenaeus, and, and uh, many of the anti-heresy church fathers, it's more a matter of creating, of defining their own position by virtue of what they're not. And so a lot of the heresiophobic uh, language is really language designed to uh, exclude, and by excluding, then when they defined Orthodoxy, and so there's kind of a fear-based dynamic that's going on in the emergence of orthodoxy in the in the period of late antiquity, and you don't see exactly the same kind of dynamic, for example, in uh, Buddhism in the emergence of uh, Buddhism, not in quite the same way. Christianity has a particular kind of di dynamic that is pretty deeply embedded in it that later it turns into uh, an inquisitional dynamic. So is it safe to say that the idea of thought control started with the heresiologists? I wouldn't call it thought control exactly, although I suppose you, you could term it that. It's rather creating, creating a, dyna a particular kind of uh, dynamic that is useful for self-definition and also uh, requires a scapegoat other. And I think it's that uh, it's really a social dynamic that starts to emerge. So that would be more what I would focus on. Although there is an element of uh, thought control in the sense that some things are allowed to be thought or uh, are acceptable and others are unacceptable. And there's a dynamic of regarding some people as the excluded heretic, blaming them for you know, the decline or destruction of some kind of social structure. That's what you see emerging in contemporary forms of totalitarianism, where heresy in communist or in a fascist context, it, heresy is not, it might actually be religion. It may be adherence to a religion as opposed to secularism. But it's still the same kind of social dynamic, and that's really what the book looks at. And uh, how did the Albigensian Crusade help crystallize the model for totalitarian regimes and future inquisitions? Yeah, the, I talk about the Cathars as part of the development of the Inquisition. I don't lay a lot of emphasis on that because really the, the parts of the book dealing with uh, anti-Gnostic, anti-heresy in the early period of the Church, and then the development of the Inquisition in uh, the early uh, medieval period, uh, really its culmination in institutions like the Spanish Inquisition are all background to the larger focus of the book, which is in, in the early modern and modern periods. 
but the ink, the tack on the cathars uh, certainly reflects the same kind of dynamic that you see in the early Christian period, the period of late antiquity. The difference is that whereas in early Christianity you see you see this uh, heresiophobic dynamic starting to develop with the Cathars, you actually have victims. You have uh, people who are murdered en masse. At that point, you begin to see the kind of uh, victimology that then appears again in the uh, in the uh, modern period in a different in a different form, but still there are real victims. You know, most fairly educated people are familiar with the, you know the Enlightenment philosophers and writers and uh, theologians of the 18th, 19th, uh, 20th century, but you expose a whole genre of scholars, theologians, and authors who somehow support totalitarian regimes long before the 20th century, and not only that, but they draw from the Inquisition and the heresiologists. Could you give us a few examples of uh, these people and why they supported such extreme ideology? It began really with uh, the French Revolution, which is a major turning point, I think, in... uh, uh, Western, and I think one can fairly say in world history. In the late 18th century, you have tremendous chaos, in, particularly in France, and uh, that social chaos from the French Revolution created a counter-revolution, a, a desire for order. And so, on the one hand, you have this chaos of guillotines and, and uh, Jacobin destruction in the in the French Revolution, and then you have people looking around for a, how do you develop a sense, or how do you create or enforce really a sense of order on society, and so you have uh, figures like, for example, Joseph, uh, Joseph de Maistre, who is a a figure who looked at the French Revolution and. Decide, and then he looked around and saw in Catholicism, and specifically in the uh, institution of the Inquisition, the means of instituting an order on society again. And so it's with his work and then with a subsequent author, uh, Juan Donoso Cortez, in the mid-19th century, again you had revolution emerging in Europe. In this case, a, a Spanish author, uh, Juan Donoso Cortez saw Catholicism and specifically the institution of the Inquisition, the the enforcement on society of order, the enforcement of order through a process of victimization. In other words, uh, creating an Inquisition, looking for heretics, uh, that kind of thought. Uh, explicitly defending the Inquisition as an institution, as the best of institutions, became part of of, uh, secular European language. And that same dynamic and the same language and these specific authors were then uh, directly fed, uh, they directly were cited by and fed into 20th century totalitarian uh, figures, and we can talk about some of those. Sure, uh, but that's the or that's the the shift point is the uh, late 18th and 19th century when you start to see these figures who drawing on and defending the Inquisition want to uh, create a secular order using this religious model. That's where it really, I think, uh, begins. And we have uh, we have evidence that these writers uh, were or directly influenced some of the totalitarian mentality of the 20th century. Yeah, there there are a number of authors through whom these these ideas flow. Uh, one of those authors is quite an influential one, both for the left and the right, and in fact he belonged both to fascist and to communist movements, and pretty much to any revolutionary movement he, uh, during the period of his, uh, that he lived, and that's George Sorel. Sorel wrote, uh, his most famous book is A Paean to Violence, 
and the uh, beauty and wonders of violence and violent uh, revolution. And that was drawn on by Mussolini, by Lenin, and uh, Juan Donoso Cortez uh, fed into his work and also was drawn on by the fascist the Nazi, Nazi writer Carl Schmitt. So what I'm saying is that there's a whole lineage of authors who begin to uh, draw on this inquisitional rhetoric. And uh, what's interesting, by the way, is that Sorel, Schmidt, Charles Marat, uh, French uh, nationalist writer, all of these writers during this period of the 1920s, 30s, and a little earlier than that, early 1900s into the 1930s, all the writers that I'm citing from that period are explicitly drawing on this inquisitional uh, rhetoric. Some of them are, are specifically attacking Gnosticism. Uh, for example, Sorel did that. Uh, Schmidt uh, wrote about uh, very positively about the Inquisition. Charles Maras saw uh, Catholicism and uh, inquisitional social order as necessary for secular society. And again, that's the 20th century, but they're drawing on 19th and 18th century um, models. Were they necessarily attacking the classic Gnostics, or as sometimes you point out in your book, they just use the words Gnosticism as a blanket term for any kind of counterculture modern thinker? I mean, it seems people said Nietzsche was a Gnostic and all this other nonsense. Yeah, well, there's there's two things. One is some of them were definitely specifically attacking Gnostics in the classical sense. Case in point would be um, in the in the case of Carl Schmidt, he specifically is citing Tertullian as as one of his primary models. In the case of Sorel, he's drawing. Uh, he specifically in some of his writings is attacking Gnostics in the classical sense from late antiquity. So what we're talking about is an actual anti-Gnosticism. But then there's another kind of, uh, kind of anti-Gnosticism that appears a little bit later than this period, and that's the kind of thing that you see with Eric Vergelin. With somebody like Eric Vergelin in the 1950s, 1960s, in his writing, you're seeing an anti-Gnosticism where the word Gnostic really no longer has any historical meaning. It, it really is detached from uh, any real association it, uh, with specific Gnostics like Valentinus or facilities, and it becomes a term more like people that I don't like, um, communists, for example, since Vigilin is from the right. Therefore, Gnostics, communists are sort of uh, interchangeable, <laughs> and uh, there it's it's a much more diffuse kind of uh, anti-Gnosticism. And uh, what was the turning point from when the from where religion went from the hunter to the hunter in the totalitarian arena? That really took place uh, under communism. More so than fascism, I uh, I think it's been pretty well established uh, in the past, say, ten or fifteen years, that fascism, even though it's usually thought of as belonging to the right, fascism is actually uh, certainly in Italy, it's a movement that emerged from the left. Um, so political, the political spectrum requires a little bit of careful differentiation here. It's not as simple as right versus left, but definitely the anti uh, the anti religious dimension of communism came to a head under Stalinism. Uh, but it was there, you know, under Leninism. And the anti religious uh, dimension of communism, even though it's Drawing on this, what really is a, a, I think, a religious pathology, anti, anti Nazism, anti, anti heresy. Under communism, religion itself becomes the heresy. 
And so you, Christians, people who are religious in general, become much more identified with the enemy, and the state becomes the religion. And so there, uh, under communism, heretic hunting becomes quite changed. It becomes, uh, the heretic hunting is reversed in a way, and the new orthodoxy is the orthodoxy of the state. And incidentally, the same is true, or something similar is true under national socialism, in that, again, the state itself and its doctrines become, to, uh, to a large extent, conflated with religion, or they take on a quasi-religious dimension. And so people under Nazism, uh, for example, uh, astrologers and anthroposophists and you know, a whole variety of, uh, quote, occultists, unquote, become the victims. Moving on um, towards more of the uh, future after all these uh, totalitarian regimes fell and all that, there is still a stigma of anti-Gnosticism, especially in the Christian right, isn't there? You mentioned a few books on that. Oh, yeah. There's, there are whole dimensions of American uh, history that my students are unfamiliar with. Even people who, most of my students, were not born at the time that I'm talking about or were just born. In the uh, 19, late 1970s into the 1980s into the early 1990s, you have uh, the development of, uh, in evangelicalism, what was called, uh, and is called, the Satanic Panic. And uh, that during that period, you had fear of satanic cults sweeping the uh, United States. That's a really interesting history. It's an uh, interesting development in American evangelicalism, uh, although it wasn't limited to that. That satanic panic, beginning really, it really, I trace it in the book, it begins in the mid-70s, that kind of movement, which, again, had some real victims. There were definitely people who were put in jail or their you know, lives were ruined as a result of fear of Nazism, fear of, you know, or rather fear of Satanism. Uh, and out of that kind of movement, also, and as part of it, you have a revival of anti-Gnostic rhetoric. So that emerges again during that period. Uh, that would be one era, and that's still around. There are books readily available still that uh, incorporate that kind of anti-Gnostic rhetoric, anti-occult. And you see that with Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson's book uh, in the early 1990s, which was instrumental in the book The New World Order, was instrumental in uh, actually Bill Clinton becoming uh, president because uh, the New World Order if you go back and take a look at that book, it sold very well in the early 1990s, and it it really accused George Herbert Walker Bush of being associated with the Illuminati, with a, a kind of Gnostic ascendancy, which was going to destroy the world. And so that kind of anti-Bush senior rhetoric was politically significant. So what I'm saying is that there, this kind of dynamic that we're talking about definitely existed and exists still in the United States and has played a significant role in American history. Yeah, I love how you talk about some of the books like uh, Catherine Tumber, uh, American Feminism and the Birth of New Age Spirituality, in mm -hmm. which she accuses such people as Starhawk, Louis Farrakhan, Gloria Steinman, and even Oprah Winfrey as being Gnostics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just taking it to the extreme. Or you talk about Karl Roschk, uh, The Interruption of Eternity, Modern Gnosticism, and the Origins of the New Religious Consciousness. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of brings out the whole net of esoteric thinkers like Nietzsche, Yeats, Herman Hesse, C.G. Jung. Well, that's not too far off but Mary Baker Eddy 
and all the you know great American poets, Alan Watts, uh, Carlos Castaneda, the Marquesa de Sade. It's pretty amazing how <clears throat> the word Gnostic will simply be used as a blanket statement for all that is wrong in society. It just well, hasn't stopped. That's exactly right. Carl Raschke, um, his books, his current books don't deal with that kind of thing anymore. He's kind of left that behind, but... He, you know, he was instrumental in the satanic panic. He wrote a, a best-selling book called Paint It Black, which, you know, saw, it was, it's filled with inflammatory rhetoric and fear of, of, uh, uh, satanic cults that are everywhere. And, it, and in his book, you're right, The Interruption of Eternity, he's arguing against, uh, Gnosticism and seeing Gnosticism as everywhere and, and, uh, manifesting in every figure and, a great, uh, a great scholar of Gnosticism, Yon Chulianu, uh, Yon Chulianu rather, uh, who was at uh, University of Chicago, he said, uh, he actually in a fairly famous uh, essay uh, article that he wrote uh, back in the 1980s already, uh, made fun of you know, these people who he said uh, he had achieved, finally achieved enlightenment when he realized that uh, Gnosticism, everything is Gnosticism. Freudianism is Gnostic, Jungianism is Gnostic, <laughs> you know, Republicans are Gnostic, Democrats are Gnostic, Communism is Gnostic. And, and it's that kind of, his, his uh, joking really describes something that's uh, genuinely out there, which is a, uh, the word Gnostic is a kind of broad, pejorative, that you can apply to anything. And, and as soon as you apply the, the word Gnostic, as soon as these folks do, uh, whatever it is is, is seen to be uh, diminished. And uh, it, it harks right back to that uh, ancient uh, anti-heresy kind of uh, rhetoric. And you wouldn't think that it would be in the 21st century in this country, but... Uh, uh, reflected, but there it is. It just keeps coming back over and over again. It's really quite amazing. Yeah, and do you see um, the uh, Christian right or whoever else is in power uh, turning up the heat now that there seems to be a modern Austin resurgence? Have you seen any hints of this, or should we just brace ourselves? No, there hasn't been. And I think the satanic panic, it flourished in the late 1980s, and then in the early 1990s, you had exposés in Christianity Today of some of the main the main people who fanned the flames of the satanic panic, uh, and ex- exposés of them by Christian evangelical writers, uh, very courageous ones, by the way, who went and investigated the claims of somebody like Mike Warnke, who was traveling around making a living attacking, you know, uh, people that you know, effectively he and others created out of whole cloth, you know, kind of boogeymen. And these Christian writers demonstrated the frauds that were going on, and and they really, um, it was after that that all of this rhetoric disappeared. And now, you you don't find these kinds of things in Christian bookstores. And I think that that's because, it's because of some of those uh, courageous writers who went out and investigated and discovered that you know, the, the stuff was just collecting a bunch of boogeymen in order to generate you know, money, build careers. And so you don't see it. Uh, if you watch Christian uh, evangelical television like TCT, for example, uh, you don't see this kind of uh, heresiophobia right now. You just uh, don't see inquisitional dynamics going on. Whether we'll see it in the future again, that's another question. I, you know, I would say... Almost certainly, it's going to have to re, you know, it will reemerge oh, because agree. that's the nature of things. You look at history; uh, the, the, you know, the book show, New Inquisition shows that the dynamic keeps reemerging, but always in new forms. It's never quite the same. So I don't think it would be as simple as, you know, the same, you know, the same figures would reappear in the same kinds of things. You know, I think. The evangelical community in the United States is fairly diverse, and more diverse than it's sometimes depicted. And I think 
it's certainly possible that some parts of it would buy into this whole dynamic all over again. But it hasn't happened yet, and I think it's because of the kind of collective chastening that you saw after the satanic panic of the 1980s. Well, maybe when they're when they're done with uh, gay marriage and Harry Potter and all that, they'll they'll come back for the Gnostics again. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, another, it's possible. yeah, yeah, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, and another thing which is very chilling that you point out in your group is that uh, you point out that there, you know. There's always been this paranoia from Pat Robertson about secret cabals like the Illuminati or the New World Order or the Freemasons coming from Christian groups. But many of these Christian groups are actually secret cabals pulling the strings in America. Can you tell us about this startling revelation? Yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, uh, story uh, in itself. And... I talk about that in chapter chapters uh, chapters twelve and thirteen uh, in the New Inquisitions. In, in those chapters, uh, especially uh, twelve, I cover the the long history of uh, fear of the Illuminati and Freemasons, uh, going back to actually uh, as early as seventeen ninety eight. Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robinson. And uh, so there's this long history of fear of these secret groups. But what's interesting, exactly as you point out, is that in the wake of the 19, uh, this, this kind of satanic panic, you see the ascendancy of Christian, uh, Christian group, which saw itself as the mirror image in a lot of ways of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. And that's the emergence of a group which was uh, generated to some extent, at least by uh, Tim LaHaye. He certainly played a major role and a number of other people. A group called the Council for National Policy. And the Council for National Policy includes a lot of uh, uh, wealthy, really mostly Republican figures tied in, for example, Richard, uh, Richard M. DeVos, uh, senior and junior, uh, Amway founders and a whole variety of others, uh, billionaires, meeting with Christian uh, leaders on the Christian uh, evangelical uh, movement, like LaHaye, author of the Left Behind series. And these folks, uh, they're very secretive, and they have meetings uh, in which they meet with major political figures that are on the ascendancy, and they determine policies. These there are quite a number of articles on them, uh, some quite interesting ones online. It's quite an interesting story, and the end result, and this is, this is what makes this uh, so strange, exactly as we point out, is that effectively, out of the fear of a conspiracy, a fear of Gnostics and of, you know, Illuminati and Freemasons and you know, of course, fear of Jews and anti-Semitism, you know, has right. played a role as well in this mm -hmm. uh, in the past. Out of out of all of this, you end up with this group, which itself actually has um, political power, demonstrably does, and actually works in secret in order to anoint people like George Bush Jr., uh, who met with them reportedly. If people, if it, uh, people in his administration have attended those meetings. Uh, reportedly, again, since it's secret, it's rather difficult to discern all the dimensions of uh, this particular group, the Council for National Policy. It's an interesting story. It's indicative of how this kind of fear dynamic can create a kind of mirror image of the, in itself of the very thing that it fears. And there's a certain set of ironies tied into all of this whole set of topics. And really the reason for writing the book uh, partly was just uh, discovery, you know, discovering these things and realizing them. They unveiled themselves in some respects. But also to point toward this dynamic of uh, this kind of inquisitional pathology and how it plays a role still today. It plays a role in contemporary American politics and in you know, countries 
elsewhere as well. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, we need to be aware of the nature of this dynamic so we can recognize it when it's in action. Instead of being subject to it, uh, I think by being conscious of these things, uh, and by being conscious of what's going on, we can, uh, to some extent, forestall the worst consequences of it. Oh, and I think you do a very good uh, job in your book because you uh, you thread the needle, and uh, like we spoke about, if it happened yesterday, it can happen tomorrow. The mechanism that the church fathers and the Inquisition left is still there for anybody who wants to emulate it. And uh, before we go, uh, could you tell us a little about your online publication, Esoterica? Yeah, there are actually uh, two journals that I am uh, editor or co-editor of. Esoterica is a journal that's, that was founded in 1999. And it uh, is a venue for uh, scholarship in the field of esotericism. And that is to say, scholarship that looks at mysticism, magic, secret societies, things that are classified under these things. So secret societies, currents like alchemy, for example. Uh, and so the journal is a forum for scholarship in that area, and it's changed over time. It's change somewhat in format, but the ideas behind it, the, the genesis of it, and the guiding spirit to make available scholarship in these new areas uh, of study are uh, comparatively new. What is the address? That's uh, es- esoteric.msu.edu. Okay, okay. Esoteric.msu.edu. And the other journal, the journal that I'm a co-editor of with a colleague of mine, is a journal on a journal it's called JSR, Journal for the Study of Radicalism. That's an academic journal, again, focusing on marginalized groups or figures. Um, and in this case, it's more political. And that journal, looks, uh, it's a print journal, looks at global radicalism different forms of radicalism on the left and on the right. And it does so without an ideological uh, agenda. There's no ideological agenda to simply looking at what's going on with these different radical groups um, and trying to understand and, and recognize what's happening, both what's happened in the past and what's happening now and what the connections are. So uh, both of those journals are venues for scholarship, you know, that that moves along that kind of track. Well, I highly recommend uh, listeners to take a look at it. I've uh, taken a look, and there's some good stuff. But uh, I think that's all the time we have today, Arthur. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking your time and being on the show. Well, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about you know, this book and uh, the arguments in it, because uh, I really think it's, it's helpful, it's beneficial to get out the ideas that are that are in the book and the nature of the uh, inquisitional pathology and understand, to understand how it can affect us in our own lives. Oh, I agree. It's a sobering book everybody should read. So I also highly recommend the readers to take a look at it. Or I'm sorry, the listeners to take a look at it. (laughs) But anyway, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have yourself a good day. Well, thank you. There you have it, my beloved True Seekers. Arthur vs. Luis on the endless blizzard of the Inquisition and the totalitarian regime. The revolution for Hypatia continues, but the fight has only begun and our enemies are legion, even if we don't count our own egos. Arthur often mentions in the New Inquisition the figure of the Grand Inquisitor from uh, Dostojevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, who is a symbolical bridge between the Inquisition and the totalitarian regime. He quotes the Grand Inquisitor saying, We are not working with thee but with him, the devil, 
That is our mystery. We shall be Caesars, and then we shall plan the universal happiness of man through some means of uniting all in one unanimous and harmonious ant heap. Sigh, everyone's got a better utopia for you. Now I'd like to show you that I actually work for the Christian right by denouncing a secret organization. <laughs> Just kidding. With my good friend Nathaniel Merritt, who you should always check out his weekly Logan at thegodabovegod.com, we reveal to you that in the darkest and dankest of orthodox warships, there can be found barnacles of light in the strange of places. So Nate, in a bonus interview, explains to us a secret Gnostic society that has been prevalent in all the Eastern churches since their inception, and somehow escaped the Sauronesque eyes of the Grand Inquisitors of History. Since our uh, show this week deals with the uh, modern and past heresy huntings, why don't you give us this uh, little secret about the Orthodox Church you told me about uh, through our email? It's an open secret. I mean, everyone in the Orthodox Church knows about Hesychasm, knows about the Jesus Prayer. But what they don't know is that it really is Gnosticism. Wait, can you All hold, uh, can you, 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 what did you mention? Pasichasm? Pasichasm. It, it means quiet, quietude. It, it's a Greek word meaning it, it's the quietistic spirituality of the Orthodox Church. and involves a type of meditation they call the Jesus Prayer. It's very well known, but what isn't well known is that it's really Gnosticism. The way it's normally presented to the public and the most Orthodox people, it seems very mainstream Orthodox. But once you get into it, you find out that it's really Gnostic. I followed my wife into the Greek Orthodox Church for the sake of our marriage. And once I did, I, I wound up becoming a church council member, a Sunday school teacher. I started training for the priesthood uh, for a couple of years. And I was approached by a couple of priests and even a deacon. And they wanted to have me join the Hellenic Society. And I did. And once I did that, then I was approached about this group and I, they didn't call themselves Gnostics. As we spoke, as I spoke with the priests, and I asked questions and learned more about the Jesus Prayer and the practices in Greece and Mount Athos, I discovered that, yes, this is Gnosticism. By that, apophaticism is the core of Orthodox theology. And that is saying what God is not, like God is not this chair, God is not this sky, God is not this nuclear missile. Uh, rather than saying what God is, God is love, God is spirit. It's, it's, a, it's a way of negation, the way of not knowing, other than by direct mystical experience of God through the Jesus prayer, rather than through creeds. This movement within the Orthodox Church, they don't pay any attention to the creeds, the historic creeds of the Church, or the historic spirituality of the church. They practice the Jesus prayer to have a direct experience of God and experience their own Christhood. It was explained to me that the Bible stories are in fact just stories to trigger various experiences within ourselves as we do the Jesus prayer to lead us to Christ consciousness, to the realization of our own Christhood. In fact, there are several Orthodox saints who came right out and said, I am the Christ, but that's backpedaled in the Orthodox Church. They want what exactly is the Jesus prayer you keep bringing up? Well, the full prayer that you taught at first goes, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But once you've begun to do it, it's shortened to, Lord Jesus, have mercy. Three syllables, each half. When you inhale, you think to yourself, Lord Jesus, and each syllable has to occur between heartbeats. It's very hard to learn to do this. And as you exhale, it's have mercy between heartbeats. And I was told over and over again by, by several priests and these people that when you start doing that, it'll start happening by itself in your heart. Your thoughts at least as far as this prayer goes, will begin 
to originate in your heart area. I didn't believe them. I thought, well, what hogwash? And the thoughts originate in your brain. But once I started doing this, it started doing it of itself. The prayer began to say itself in my heart. Thoughts, those words began to emanate from my heart area. And I was a mainstream Christian pretty much at the time, so that was really spooky. <laughs> it frightened me. I quit doing it. So, <laughs> right. Um, but uh, this is a very widespread movement, particularly among priests in the Orthodox Church. Not all of them. They don't approach everyone. I was approached because I was so gung-ho, and I was an acolyte, a Sunday school teacher, and uh, studying for the priesthood. So I guess I said the right things. Um, anyone can get involved in hesychasm in, in doing the Jesus prayer, but not everybody is going to be invited into this secret cabal within the practitioners of the Jesus prayer. And is this uh, movement, uh, well, I guess you say they don't overtly call themselves Gnostics, although they are Gnostic, but this tradition has been going on yes, since the are. beginning of the foundation of the Church. Well, ever since, yes, it does predate St. Gregory Pallas. Um Yes, it, in the Eastern Church, this does uh, go way back to antiquity. They don't even accept the historicity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is you. The resurrection is, is a spiritual event within you, you know, a gnosis, a realization of your own God self, the kingdom of God within. It's completely Gnostic. Some people are aware of this and are trying to expose the Orthodox Church as being uh, Gnostic at its core, but they're generally ignored. And I can't think of the names of the authors right off the top of my head, but they're ignored. So... At least take heart out there, folks, that there is a large Gnostic movement going on that is not being attacked and <laughs> destroyed. Do you see this movement happening in other Eastern churches or just the Greek Orthodox Church? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the Russian Orthodox, uh, the Romanian, the Antiochian, all of them. Yes, all of them have a strong core. They all share the same apophatic theology, the same approach. God, they're, they're dualistic, you know. God is not this computer monitor in front of me here. It's not this telephone. God is, God is our inner self, and that's where God is to be found, both as our inner self and beyond nature. The, and also, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, another, I know the Byzantine Church, they still revere Sophia. Oh, very much so. Uh, in, not in the uh, overt sort of way that it, it's done, in the uh, Gnostic circles. But yes, uh, she's uh, implored during the Divine Liturgy. Sophia, you chant out in the Greek Orthodox Church, Sophia or Thea, wisdom, let us attend to her. And it's, it's, it's several times in the liturgy, but uh, it it's really is played down. Sergius, uh, Ser Sergius Bergikov, a Russian Orthodox uh, the theologian of the 20th century, came very close to making Sophia the fourth member of the Godhead, and he was reprimanded by higher-ups. He was the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in the Orthodox Church. I hope I'm still Yeah, yeah, that. I'm glad to see that these movements are out there and that the modern uh, heresy hunters haven't gotten to them. Um, you mentioned also that the, so this Jesus prayer, you say, is the most powerful form of meditation you've experienced. Yes, it is. And I, I mentioned to you the other day, you can read about it in the J.D. Salinger novel of Fanny and Lily, and also the spiritual classic, uh, The Way of a Pilgrim, and the pilgrim continues on his way. But please, folks, don't practice it on your own. It is really potent. It will bring up all your deepest, darkest fears and insecurities. It will cause them to manifest to you as angels and demons. You need to be with someone who is trained in it, knows what to expect, and will help you through this stuff. It's not something to enter into lightly like you would transcendental meditation. It's a whole new world. So if you're thinking about doing it, get involved in a local Orthodox parish.